Good morning. I'm Wilma Jones, and it is my joy to share God's Word with you today as we meet together. The scripture is in Mark's Gospel, chapter 5, verses 21 through 43, and in your daily discipleship book, this lesson is found on page 20. It is session 2. It is entitled, Jesus Heals a Woman and a Girl. In Jesus' encounter with this woman and a girl, he calls us to have faith. He wants us to have faith in his power over three things, affliction, shame, and death. And so we're going to read the scripture first, and then we'll very briefly have uh, discuss some points uh, to find in this lesson. Would you join me in prayer before we begin? <clears throat> Father, I thank you for the truth of your word. Open our hearts and our minds as we study the word of truth you have for us today. And we pray for our land and for our lives in this time of affliction, time of shame, and time of death. And we pray for those in our midst who are suffering. Thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit to teach us today concerning these things. And it is in the name of Jesus, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Let's begin in Mark 5, 25 through 29. We will see how to trust in Jesus' power to remove suffering of affliction. <clears throat> Verse 25. And there was a woman who had a, had a discharge of blood for 12 years, 26 and who had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. Verse 27, when she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his cloak, I will be healed. Immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed of her suffering. First, first, let's look at her suffering just quickly. Can you imagine 12 years of suffering with a blood disorder, a bleeding disorder? She suffered physically, hemorrhaging blood, going from physician to physician, finding no cure and no relief, only spending her money, all that she had, and only getting worse. She suffered emotionally, the shame of this disease, because her condition made her unclean, and she lived as an outcast. She suffered social rejection and being shunned by those around her, even her family, and she came up empty. What do you do when you've done all you can do and come up with empty hands? She was desperate. In your, leader, in your guide, you will have a question that you may discuss. I encourage you to discuss it in your Zoom meeting or in your personal reflection. Um, what are some ways people try to deal with desperate situations? Let's go on with our lesson. Then she heard about Jesus. It says in scripture, she heard about Jesus. What did she hear? Well, people were talking about Jesus, his miracles. She heard he had healed. She heard his words, what he said, uh, and they were truth. And they had spread throughout the land, and she learned, heard of those he had healed. So she believed that God's power was present in some way in Jesus Christ. All she had was a simple, profound faith that he could do what others could not. So she decided to reach out to him. She reached out with empty hands. She had nothing to offer. She just, nothing more that she could do. She wanted just to touch the hem of his garment 
knowing that she would be healed. So she took a chance. She took a big risk. Since Jewish law mandated that contact with graves, blood, or death made one ceremonially unclean, the plan for getting near Jesus involved great risk. Anyone she touched was considered unclean, and she had to work through a moving crowd to get to Jesus. As she reached him, touching the hem of his garment, she was healed. Immediately, the flow of blood dried up. She knew she was healed. Immediately, she knew it. Her faith was confirmed. In Romans 10, 13 through 15, it tells us <coughs> that before anyone comes to Jesus in faith, they must first hear about him. Their response is within their heart. Will they reach out? As believers, we have the responsibility and the joy of talking about Jesus. Others may hear about him in that way. The outcast woman did. Trust. The second point of our lesson is to trust. Can we, will we, trust in Jesus' power to remove the shame of impurity? Let's continue with her story because she was impure because of this issue of blood and now she was healed. So, in Mark 5, 30 through 34, what happened to her next and what did she receive from Jesus beyond the end of her physical suffering? Verse 30, And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned to the crowd and asked, Who touched my garment? His disciples said to him, You see the people crowding against you, and yet you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came to Jesus, came in fear and trembling, and she fell down before him and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. Despite the jostling crowd, Jesus knew something had happened. The power had left him, and he knew it. It had left him through faith's touch. And he knew that was not the end of her healing, but only the beginning. So why would Jesus call for her to come out and reveal herself? Did, he, did her unclean touch make him unclean, according to the law? No, quite the opposite happened. Jesus' power made her clean. His power removed her shame and gave her righteousness. Did he need to accuse her of misconduct? No, instead he tenderly elicited from her a wonderful testimony of what the Lord had done for her. She told the truth of it all. She confessed everything about her life. She told why she came to Jesus and how he healed her. Why did Jesus call her out in front of everyone? They were in a big crowd. Why did he not simply permit her to remain anonymous and go her way? The work was done. No, it wasn't. Now he wanted to remove her shame and to bring her into glory. For one thing, he did it for her sake. He wanted to be her, more to her than just a healer, a physician. He wanted to be her savior and friend as well. He wanted her to lift her head and look into his face, feel his tenderness, hear his loving words of assurance, to hear his voice. He called her daughter and sent her on her way with a benediction of peace, peace. Finally, she had a sense of well-being, a sense of harmony in her life, a sense of prosperity, 
and the absence of hostility and the absence of shame. He removed her shame. By calling her daughter, she belonged. She was family. She was a daughter of the king, no longer outcast, no longer alone. To be made whole means much more than receiving physical healing. Jesus had given her spiritual healing as well. In your book, you're going to be addressing what is faith? What is faith? It is more than being simple, simply a mental agreement of historical facts. Genuine faith begins with a recognition and confession of the truth of the gospel, followed by receiving Christ personally as Lord and Savior of your life. Biblical faith does not is not blind, for it rests on the historical life, death, and resurrection of Christ. Her faith rested on Jesus, the Word made flesh, dwelling within her lifetime. We, like this woman, have a voice to sing. A precious old hymn comes to mind. Out of my sorrow, bondage, and night, Jesus, I come. Jesus, I come. Into thy freedom, gladness, and light. Jesus, I come to thee. Out of my sickness, into thy health. Out of my want, and into thy wealth. Out of my sin, and into thyself. Jesus, I come to thee. And I say, hallelujah. <laughs> what about death? This is the third part of our lesson. We have to face death. In this passage, can we trust in Jesus' power to remove the curse of death? Let's read Mark 5, 35 through 43. I want to give you a little background because earlier in this same passage, Jairus, a ruler of the synagogue, had fallen at Jesus' feet as in the crowd, begging desperately for Jesus to heal his only daughter, who was dying, and so he said, yes, let's go, and they were on their way when this interruption with the woman occurred, and Jesus was just finishing talking to her when Jairus received the bad news concerning his daughter. Verse 35, while he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house someone who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. And when he had entered, he said to them, Why are you making commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. Verse 40, And they laughed at him, but he put them all outside and took a child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kumi, which means little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking, for she was 12 years of age. And they were immediately overcome with amazement. Let's discuss a few things here. Jairus received the worst news anyone can receive. His daughter died. Jesus responded to the news of the death of his da Jairus' daughter with two commands to Jairus immediately. Do not fear. It was a negative command. Do not be terrified, alarmed, or afraid. Don't let this cause you to want to run away and to turn away. Fear was the natural response at this time in a time such as this. And Jesus asked Jairus to do quite the impossible. Do not fear. 
Then he said the positive command, only believe. Jesus pointed Jairus away from fear through the power of faith, hope, trust, that the day would not end in tragedy, but in hope, even a hope that points beyond death. When something in our lives doesn't go well, it can become difficult to trust that God has a plan of glory and good for us. Biblical faith is trusting Jesus for an eternal resurrection to, and that he always does what is good and right in the meantime. They traveled on to the home of Jairus and Jesus demonstrated this greatest hope that we too have. He raised Jairus' daughter from the dead, a demonstration of the greatest hope healing, an eternal one, a resurrection hope. It's to this hope we must look. It's to this hope that this passage points. It's to this hope which Jesus gladly calls us to believe without fear. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust in I don't remember the words. I don't trust in, in something alone, just in Jesus' name. This passage points to the greatest healing from Jesus, the eternal one. You have a discussion question. What are some ways the resurrection power of Jesus frees us to live by faith and obedience? Your mission this week. Let me discuss this for a moment. Trusting Jesus is the proper response to all troubles, physical and spiritual. We can never make ourselves whole. Only Jesus can. He healed a woman and raised a little girl from the dead. And one day this dying body will be raised to newness of life. God will give us a glorified body that will never hurt and never die again. Until that day... We look to Jesus for hope, knowing that the promise is sure because of his own resurrection. Trust him. Don't fear. Only believe. And invite others to join you. Tell them to come as you are, and he will receive you. Come empty-handed, and he will enrich you. Come guilty, and he will forgive you. Come trembling, and he will reassure you. He will keep every promise in the Bible, and he will do it freely and personally for you because he is faithful to everyone who has faith in him. Do you. God bless you in the study of this word.